community power together. Before we begin, I just want to take a couple of minutes to introduce myself and um, my co-trainer, Nadia. So my name is Johanna Mustafa and I am Polygon's Policy and Advocacy Manager. I work closely with our board of directors and legislative and media team members to develop and execute strategies in support of Poly uh, Polygon's policy agendas. So what I do is really monitor policy developments in Congress and identify opportunities for proactive responses um, on a national and grassroots level as well. Um, I also bring a lot of experience in national and grassroots organizing um, with the Muslim community specifically. And joining me today is our board member, Nadia, who will also tell you more about herself. Hi everyone, my name is Nadia Mozafar. I am on the board of Polygon Education Fund and also um, in my full-time job, I'm an attorney and I work in the juvenile justice child welfare reform area. Um, and at Polygon, I help with a lot of the uh, kind of organizational administrative matters as well as um, joining Johanna and other um, staff and board members on trainings um, and do that type of policy work both in my full-time job and at Polygon. So really looking forward to being here today and to share some of the um, things that we have learned um, from our policy advocacy experiences with you all and uh, learning from you as well. So we are here from Polygon Education Fund, and overall, we're a national nonpartisan non nonprofit organization and really dedicated to amplifying uh, the Muslim American voice on Capitol Hill. And we do this through training, education, advocacy, and educating policymakers um, to make progress on issues that are of concern to the Muslim community and of our progressive allies all throughout all throughout the country. And so we are really fortunate to have presented at Netroots a number of times. Um, and what we really find is that the skills that we teach to the Muslim community on strategic advocacy, lobbying, et cetera, is such an important skill for all of our allies and all of our colleagues uh, working in these progressive spaces to learn. And so, um, so we're excited to kind of jump into that today. Our agenda today, um, we're really going to go into a few things. So first, we're going to, because our organization, as we said, is a is really focused on the Muslim um, community, and, and we know that's a community that's of important to a lot of the Netroots attendees. We're going to start with a little bit about Muslim civic engagement and what that looks like, um, go into a little bit of a refresher on the legislative branch, and then um, really dig into some best practices around congressional advocacy and how to take your advocacy to the next level, build community power, and we will take, um, we'll have time to take questions at the end. So if you do have questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat, as Johanna said, but um, we'll try to do most of them at the end. Thank you, Nadia. And so um, just before we delve into the meat of this uh, training, um, I know we have a diverse group of attendees today, so whether you identify as a Muslim or identify with the Muslim community or not, I think it's very helpful to just take the Muslim community and the Muslim civic engagement today as a case study um, uh, so that we can discuss certain aspects that I think will make sense towards um, uh, the very end of our training. And so I just wanted to quickly share a report from the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding um, that they published not too long ago this year, and I think is very crucial in guiding our efforts as a collective. So here's what we've learned. Um, we found from the report that the Muslim community, despite um, what a lot of us might assume, is an active and civically engaged community. So to begin with, we've seen record turnout from the Muslim community in the 2020 election year. We've also made consider uh, considerable progress with voter engagement and voter registration. Um, the report found that in 2020 alone, 78% of American Muslims were registered to vote, which is a significant increase from 2016, where only 60% um, 
of eligible American Muslims were registered. The report also found that regular mosque attendance is tied to greater civic engagement. And as someone who's led voter engagement campaigns in my local committee and was consistent in engaging with our committee members at the mosques, I can confirm the great impact a well-organized and active community space, including places of worship, can have on the uh, civic participation of the committee that you're targeting and on our collective. Um, another very important finding was that American Muslims are also mostly interested in domestic issues, showing that Muslim constituents are very invested um, and have great stakes in local and national issues, which is also very, very important because I think there's this myth or misunderstanding that maybe um, immigrant communities or, you know, uh, Muslim communities are more interested in foreign policy or foreign affairs. So I think that was also very interesting and something to keep in mind um, as we discuss how we can approach our advocacy efforts. And then finally, um, while many Muslims tend to vote, um, especially during national elections, it's also important to note that there's still a steady and small group of voters who do not vote for various reasons. Some don't feel their vote matters, others are civically active, but don't believe their priorities are reflected in the candidates running for office. And even those who do turn out to national elections fail to do so on local city and state levels because they believe only national elections matter. Um, and I'm sure we all know, or at least some of us who are active in organizing spaces, we know that um, with the midterm elections, for instance, we also see a lower turnout. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, again, regardless of the committees that you're organizing or what identities we bring into the space today, um, keeping those uh, different factors in mind and how maybe they're similar with the people we organize or um, similar to our own backgrounds or not, are, I think are very important. Um, and so one last, uh, I think, couple of findings that I also found very interesting is that Muslim Americans, um, are most li more likely to have attended a town hall in 2020 and more likely to contribute or volunteer with a political campaign. And what that shows us is that um, even as marginalized community members, Muslims go above and beyond, right? So attending a town hall or being politically engaged in political campaign is going above and beyond just casting um, our votes at the ballot. However, that doesn't always reflect in terms of maybe trust in the system or, um, you know, uh, maybe not all of those people who do attend a town hall or are politically engaged think that there is active change in policy um, that is reflective of their lived experiences. So again, that goes back to why we're here and how we can change that narrative, how we can become more strategic as advocates and make sure that our efforts are counted. Um, and again, if you have any questions about these findings, please make a note of it and we will be sure to discuss towards the very end. But for the sake of time, um, we will just leave the Q&A towards the very, very end um, of our 15 minutes. So now with that background, we want to move to a little bit of a broader discussion on what exactly advocacy is, so we can think about how most strategically to do it. So advocacy is a pretty wide a term that encompasses a lot of these. So it, it includes research, public education, lobbying, voter education, a wide variety of activities whose overall goal is to influence public policy. And as I'm sure everyone here is, is familiar, advocacy spaces are very diverse and include a wide range of activities, expertise, areas of focus and interest. And really anyone can and should serve as an advocate on the issues that are important to them, including you, whether that's in your personal capacity as a you know someone who lives in the US or in your official role at a nonprofit organization or, an, or, a, or another type of organization um, that brings you to NetRoots today. Um, so now that we kind of have a broad definition of advocacy, we want to think about how advocacy compares um, to 
um, to lobbying. So ad, as we just mentioned, advocacy, lobbying is just one type of advocacy. And um, there's many other types of advocacy that we will be going over today. Um, and lobbying sometimes gets a little bit of a bad name because it's often tied to big money. And it's often true that a lot of people with a lot of money are better able to lobby and advocate for um, things that they want. Um, however, that's not lobbying and paying a lot of money to, uh, to members of Congress is definitely not the only form of advocacy. And there's so many other avenues of advocacy that nonprofits and community members that they can engage in. And so, for example, we're going to talk about the Muslim travel ban um, later in the presentation. And um, that's that's something that took a lot of advocacy from a lot of different sources, um, including community leaders, lawyers, organizers, activists, and constituents like ourselves. Um, and all of you. So uh, just keeping in mind that that lobbying is something that we're going to be talking about, um, but advocacy is so much more than that. Will you go back one slide? Oh, my bad. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So when we really think about um, how we advocate in Congress, um, we, we should get a sense of what are all the sources of influence. So one thing that we talked about is a lot of and a lot of us might have this very negative impression that the only way to make change through Congress is through donations or by you know big firms giving a lot of money to certain politicians. And so of course we're not here to ignore the realities of, of money and the role that it plays in politics. But in, a, in addition, to special interest groups and big donors, elected officials and lawmakers really are influenced by so many other things, their party leaders, their colleagues, the media, electoral prospects. Um, and then most importantly, where what we're here to talk about is, and the next slide, constituents. Um, and throughout our presentation today, we really want to highlight the important role that constituents play and how it really is this big source of um, big source of influence on um, on politicians, on the policymakers, and really the power to put and keep elected officials in office is with the constituents, is with individual people and, and really lawmakers are public servants that are supposed to work for us and represent us. But the only ways we can kind of stay on their radar and really compete with the with the big money is through like consistent advocacy, building coalitions and being very strategic in our advocacy. Right. Exactly. We hold the power. So um, if you ever doubt your role as a constituent for whatever reason, I want you to remember these quotes that we have from congressional staff who can assure you that your efforts are never a waste. So congressional staff tell us that direct constituent interactions have more influence on lawmakers' decisions than other strategies. So just you know, make a note of that, keep that in mind, um, and tell that to your friends and family, your neighbors, anyone who might not you know, have the confidence um, to reach out to their elected official. Um, and we really don't want lobbyists and big donors to intimidate us. Another um, very important quote that I want to share is that 94%, the vast majority of congressional staff also believe that direct constituent contact influences undecided lawmakers. So why is that important to keep a note of? Because Again, we're talking about strategic adv advocacy. And when we talk about the strategy in advocacy, we're usually talking about how to, we can't, oftentimes we don't have the capacity or resources to contact all Congress members, right? But we can target undecided lawmakers, um, especially if we are, we are constituents of those uh, members of Congress, or we can build coalitions with people who have contact with those undecided lawmakers to push for a certain issue. So again, just wanted to highlight this um, so that we keep it in mind as we move forward and talk about all the different tools and avenues at our disposal and how we can move things in Congress and um, influence policy change. And then the last thing that I wanted to highlight is that again, the vast majority of congressional staff believe that personal stories 
help shape legislators' opinions. Um, very, very important. We keep hearing this over and over again from members of Congress, from their staff, from organizers, policy experts. We do the necessary work, right? We do the boring work of writing legislation, drafting it, pushing for it. But at the end of the day, we are talking about lived experiences. So it's very important for us to make space for those lived experiences and highlight them in the work that we do. And again, we will discuss how we can strategically do that um, in this day and age. So at, before we get into that, we're just gonna do a very quick refresher of the legislative branch. And um, as we think about how we do uh, congressional advocacy, we just want to remind folks who we're doing this advocacy towards. So um, on the next slide, we have uh, uh, just a breakdown of the House and the Senate. And um, the, just some basic information, the House of Representatives has 435 um, members, one member per district. And right now there's 220 Democrats, 212 Republicans with three vacancies. They're serving two year terms. And um, the Senate has 100 members, two members per state. Um, right now there's 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans. Um, but this essentially means that the Democrats have a slim majority um, because uh, any ties are broken by the vice president, who, of course, um, is a Democrat, and they are serving six-year terms. So overall, um, when you think about partisan politics, uh, there's um, a fairly good um, uh, chance for, uh, uh, who knows what there's a chance for, but overall, we can see that there's a uh, slim majority for the Democrats, both in the House and the Senate, and with the president's um, President Biden and uh, Vice President Harris also being Democrats, um, there's like a slim window of time where there is um, some potential for uh, legislation that Democrats would traditionally favor. Right. Um, you know, again, we show these numbers to just, it's always important when we talk about strategy, we talk about power mapping or just targeting, you know, different elected officials to know the lay of the land. So this is why we just wanted to remind ourselves, not just you, but remind ourselves of what we're dealing with in Congress. Um, if, again, if you are involved in the space, then you probably notice that specific pieces, like very important pieces of legislation have been continuously blocked because of this very thin margin. So um, again, that means that we need to push harder. We need to be more strategic. We need to be smarter about everything that we do and how we move certain targets. Um, and so with that being said, um, I also want us to get an idea of what a congressional office looks like. And um, keep in mind that, you know, I think, again, I am keeping in mind that our attendees are probably experts on some level, but then I'm sure we have folks who might not do this full time. Um, so just a general rule that if you are trying to contact your member of Congress, um, a lot of them will try to meet with you, but realistically speaking, um, you will probably meet with one of their staff members and not the actual Congress member. Um, even for you know policy experts like ourselves, we almost never end up meeting with the member of Congress, but we have uh, close relationships with their staff and policy advisors. So I would just want to share this quick um, uh, graphic to give you an idea of what that looks like. Let's say you are calling, you will most likely speak to a staff assistant or an intern. I've interned at those offices. I know what it's like. Um, we, you know, as an intern, I used to take note of everything that constituents said, everything that coalition members said, anyone calling to um, send a message or speak on an issue is recorded and those notes then go to the staff members and from the staff members they go to the chief of staff and from chief of staff it goes to the member of congress right before they go and vote on an issue or take any action on an issue so again um don't be discouraged if you are not speaking with you know a senior policy advisor or the chief of staff or the congress member 
your message will reach them eventually. And on the other hand, let's say you do manage to uh, secure a meeting with a member of Congress or their chief of staff, um, that same message and that same, you know, the demands or call to action that you have for them will eventually flow back to the staff that we have here, right? So the LDs, the legislative director, the policy advisors, all of those people, because they are the experts. Usually the Congress member is not the one doing the research, not doing the, the bulk of the work and the labor on a specific issue. So they will send all of that information back to their staff. And um, that's where most of the work is done. So I just think, you know, that's very helpful to keep in mind as we discuss our next, um, uh, you know, uh, best practices and tips for contacting your member of Congress. And so on that note, now that we know what a congressional office looks like and, um, you know, the political dynamics in Congress, how do we contact our members of Congress? Um, one thing I really appreciate about um, Congress is, and their websites, is that it's fairly easy to navigate. So um, if you go to www.house.gov or www.senate.gov, you can easily find your senator and you can easily find your member. For uh, House representatives, you will need your address because obviously, you know, as we know, we have uh, different representatives based on our district and where we live and some districts have multiple representatives. Um, so you might even have to put your exact street address sometimes. Uh, for the Senate, it's a lot easier. We all have two senators per state. And so you'll just find the full list of senators and where you can reach them. You can also call them at um, this number that we have on the slide, and that is the switchboard operator. Also very, very super convenient and easy to use. You just call, it will ask you a couple of questions and uh, navigate to that specific office that you are looking for. So once you've found the office that you're trying to reach, and you get on that call, it's very important that you identify yourself as a constituent if you are a constituent. So um, I think that's that's the golden rule with constituent advocacy, right? Is that you have to identify yourself as such. And um, we say that because for a member of Congress that wants re-election and is really focused on building that strong relationship with their constituents, that will matter and they will take your message into account and make it a priority if they're really doing their job, right? Because I know some representatives or some <laughs> Congress members might not feel the same way. But as a general rule, it's very important that you identify yourself as a constituent. Um, and then also prepare a simple and short script. So keep it short, one issue per email or call and explain why the issue is important to you. Keep in mind that if you are calling, um, you know, you are calling an office at a very, very, very fast paced environment. They're receiving calls every other minute. So keep it short. Don't lose their attention and, you know, get straight to the point. If you're sending out an email, same rule for that as well. They're probably receiving a lot of different emails about a lot of different issues. So try to keep it short, precise and highlight your demand, which brings me to our last point, make a clear ask. A lot of people, and I've seen this happen so many times, they will speak on an issue but forget to make an ask. So they'll say, I care about human rights of whatever community, and then talk about it for like 15 minutes and then forget to make a clear ask. Okay, so what do you want of this specific elected official or member of Congress? Is there a specific bill you want to, uh, you want them to vote on or against? Um, is there an action, like a specific action that you want them to take? Make that very clear in your ask. And um, so once we, you know, have that covered, which I think is the easiest part, right? Just making that first initial contact, you can then maybe go back to your community um talk to your friends talk to any policy experts that you may might know or any leaders that maybe you have contacts with or connections to 
and um, organize an office visit. So this is what a lot of people call lobbying, right? We have lobby visits and here's how you can, even as a, an average American, um, organize your own lobby visit. So first you wanna do your own research, learn about the member, do they sit on any committees? What is their voting record? Did they make a public statement on the issue that you are passionate about or speaking on? Um, just know, again, know as much as you can about the, um, the member of Congress and even their staff members, if you can, like chief of staff. Does the chief of staff, um, uh, you know, is the chief of staff on board with your issue or not? Because those people also influence policy. And then once you have that covered, you want to organize yourselves. Um, so you'll have the facilitator and you'll have different people um, kind of having different roles, right? I am just going to give this as a recommendation. I know it depends on the situation, depends on who you have joining, but just as a general recommendation, um, usually you should have a facilitator, a speaker that's kind of leading the meeting, um probably the one you know sending out the the email or making that call to schedule that meeting um so that their name is familiar uh to the staff members and then everyone else joining will have let's say one or two people share a personal narrative especially if they're constituents um speaking about their lived experiences and why it matters um for them to be in that space and why it matters for them to push this specific issue um, and then you'll have some talking points, of course, right? Why does it matter? And what do you want to ask? Again, is very, very important. After you've organized yourselves, you've conducted the meeting, you've had that conversation with their staff, um, it's very important to also debrief after the meeting. So what that allows you to do, again, because we're trying to um, address strategic advocacy, is to build a strategy. So when you debrief, um, it's very important to review and record what you've um, what you've learned from that meeting, any notes, any positions that maybe the staff members shared with you. Um, you know, are they supporting the cause? Do they need an extra push? How can you achieve that? It will give you an idea of next steps. Basically, what do you need to do to keep pushing? Um, and then following up is very, very important as well. So obviously thank them almost immediately after your meeting and make sure that you also send that in writing via email so that they have their uh, your contact information um, for them to follow up with you as well on anything that you mentioned during the email and maintain that relationship. So again, a lot of those calls and meetings and emails might not result in immediate change, but what they'll do is start that relationship with your elected official or with um, just a member of Congress in general. And down the line, once you have that trust, once you have that relationship, um, it'll be much easier to influence policy. All right, again, if you have any questions on these, please make a note of it and we will get to it um, towards the very end. And so the last thing I want to mention very briefly is following up. I know I mentioned it in a very uh, short note, but again, want to stress the importance of following up with anything that we do, whether it's community organizing or um, advocacy work on the Hill, more you know, uh, advocacy and policy focused in Washington, D.C., consistency is very, very, very important. So you have to be very patient. You have to be consistent and think about, um, you know, achieving small victories, but also thinking about the bigger picture and what you're doing on the long term, on the long run. So, you know, that follow up will start with a meet. Um, your again, interaction will start with a call or an email or a meeting, and then follow up with a thank you. And then maybe you'll track legislation, and we'll talk about how you can easily track this uh, legislation in a bit. But um, you know, you'll start learning more about the issue and how those specific targets that you're meeting with are moving on that issue. And then maybe after that, you'll decide to um, invite a couple more leaders or a couple more committee members and visit them 
uh, when they're in their districts and again, keep pushing. So consistency and following up and um, keeping an eye on the on the goal and what you're doing on a long, um, you know, uh, on the long term is very, very important. Alrighty, so Nadia will tell us about travel legislation. <laughs> yes, thank you. And and before I do that, I just want to say thank you for all of the really helpful comments that are coming in during this presentation. And um, um, just uh, quickly, I just wanted to note that um, Nicole, your comment: this is only for DC office, but constituents should also work in their district. That's absolutely right. So a lot of what we are. Um, what we're talking about, uh, we're focusing on DC, but just remember that there's also offices that can, that representatives um, and senators have in the state or in the in the locality, um, and so these kinds of things are equally important there as well. And then also, you know, Polygon, we are really focused at the federal level, but. There's also outreach to be done to your state representatives, your local representatives, and the same strategies apply there as well. Um, so there's nothing nothing about this that means it has to be done um, only at the federal level. So please um, uh, feel free to feel free, and we encourage you to also advocate at the state um, and local levels as well. Um, and so, um, and, and that goes for this next piece about tracking legislation. So we just very quickly wanted to um, highlight um, congress.gov does have a bill tracker that um, I spend a lot of time on, but overall it lets you put in um, either the bill number or the representative that introduced it. And it's a really good tool to um, look up specific pieces of legislation, read the text of them, or um, you'll be able to see like where are they in the process of um, process of of passage. And so when you're preparing for a legislative visit, for example, you can quickly look up, oh, I'm meeting with this senator or this representative. Let me look at what bills they've introduced lately um, if I just want to gauge their interest in something. Or if there's a specific piece of legislation that you're interested in, you can look up and see like, oh, it's in this um, in this committee. Um, and so um, uh, maybe I should try to talk to someone in that committee or see if I have any representatives on that committee. So um, this is a really helpful tool. And I know that I worked with a lot of state legislative trackers as well. So if you're working in a specific state, um, also feel free to look up and see if there's something similar on the state side. And um, really, another we wanted to make a, on this issue is just wanting to hammer home one more time uh, why this type of advocacy is really important. And so theoretically, um, like research has been done kind of about the impact of congressional advocacy from constituents. And um, so what, we're, what they found is that five calls puts a policy issue on the agenda of your representative or your senator or the, or the office that it becomes something that they talk about. Um, seven calls keeps your policy issue on the agenda. And when there's more than 10 calls, it puts the issue at the top of the, the agenda at the next staff meeting. So there's something that you feel that your um, representative isn't addressing or you want them to think about um, not only you know making calls and doing advocacy yourselves, but really getting your community, getting your friends, getting your neighborhood, like whoever can come together to support an issue, the more um, folks you gather together and the more strategic you are about that, the more impact this advocacy can make. Right. So now that we are talking about how to take our advocacy efforts to the next level and, you know, really talking about people power and, and making an impact, um, I would just want to give the the Muslim ban, the Muslim travel ban, as an example of how effective community organizing um, and advocacy looks like. And I'm sure a lot of us here are familiar with the Muslim travel ban um, that was, um, you know, 
inflicted and separated families for four years during the Trump administration. So it was um, four years of organizing, four years of advocacy work, of coalition building, of uh, strategic policy change um, that finally resulted with the repeal of the ban um, this year in 20, um, earlier this year in 2020. And so just wanted to highlight that win before we move on and start talking about coalition building and how we can uh, base build and take those efforts to the next level. Um, when we organize people power, we win. Just remember that part. Um, and that, you know, again, um, anyone and everyone can be an advocate. So I know a lot of us might be experts or might, you know, do this full time or be very super engaged. Um, and maybe that's why we're here <laughs> in this virtual space. But even if we have, let's say, friends who are professional, like doctors, for instance, who don't have the time to do the work that we do um, full time, they can also be advocate advocates in their own way. Um, my mom, my sister, my neighbor, anyone can be an advocate and organize and help push for, for change. So just want to put that out there, is that people power is very, very important. Um, and on that note, we want to talk about coalition building and address, um, you know, uh, the importance of organizing people in addition to contacting our members of Congress, in addition to sending out those emails and having those lobby visits. We can't do it on our own. If I, as Johanna, just, you know, continuously have those calls and meetings, but it's just me and I have no one to back me and I'm not accountable to my community, um, it will be obvious. And the members of Congress will know that, you know, and they'll see the lack of, of um, constituents backing that specific issue or lack of pressure from grassroots organizing. So that's very, very important to keep in mind is that, you know, it's great once we tackle everything that we just mentioned, taking it to the next level means that we are building partnerships and building relationships with others who, even if, if they might not share the same, um, even if they're not advocating on the same issue that we're advocating on, we can build solidarity with other communities as well and try to find um, parallels or find opportunities for collaboration to kind of benefit both committees. So um, I like to use this graphic to explain what that looks like, <laughs> just to make it easier and more memorable, hopefully. Um, so the way I think about it is, you know, we want to grow, a lot of people say build power, but let's think about it as growing power. So we want to grow horizontal and vertical power, right? And what that means is that, you know, think of a tree. For a tree to be strong, we need very, very strong roots. And so we really need to spend some time and effort building that horizontal power at the grassroots level on city, local, and state levels before we can um, have, um, you know, an impact on a national level. Um, and that will look like, you know, a strong base of activists, a strong base of cross movement relationships. So, you know, back to my point about solidarity, sometimes um, um, just to take the Muslim ban, for instance, as an example, a lot of the work and a lot of the wins and victories that we've seen were not only due to the Muslim community and the impacted people. Yes, people were accountable and were rooted and grounded in the lived experiences of the impacted folks, right? The people who were separated, the families who were separated as Muslims. But um, a lot of the work was also made possible because of solidarity um, organizing. So we've seen a lot of solidarity from the Japanese American community, for instance, um, the Latinx communities, our black siblings, um, literally everyone and anyone were out there. I remember images, at, you know, I, I'm sure we all remember images um, and visuals from people shutting down the airports. I'm in California, so what comes to mind is people shutting down LAX. That was very, very powerful, you know, in such short notice, people turned out and um, they, you know, stood with impacted families. So that's what horizontal power, the grassroots power looks like. 
um, at a very local level. Once we have that strength, everything else becomes super easy because you've already have that activated base of people. All you need to do is just apply those tips and best practices and lessons that we've learned in terms of strategic advocacy and targeting people, you know, targeting specific um, stakeholders or key players to move certain policy. But without that very strong base, the roots, um, it'll be very hard to to even see the fruits of this tree, right? Um, and then we also need to keep in mind that we, right, we have very strong um, roots, we're grounded, we're accountable, but we also want to move vertically. We want to grow and we want to eventually see the fruits of this tree. So that's what vertical power looks like. And that means, you know, influencing government and power brokers. Um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense to me and I, I like to use this example all the time but again without the roots I think it'll be very very hard to move anything um, whether it's policy or any movement any campaign that you're working on on a national level or you know have that huge impact um, and one last comment I would like to make on this is um, Nadia also mentioned this, right? We, as Polygon, um, focus on federal level policy work, but that does not mean that, you know, we do not value and encourage folks to also do their own uh, work on city state um, levels as well. So I'm just gonna use this uh, example as um, just to kind of showcase like why it's important. Um, so let's, again, taking the Muslim ban as an example, if we didn't have people turning out on the streets in Anaheim, California on a city level or in Los Angeles um, or, go, you know, going to the airports and then um, having those statewide campaigns and then taking those statewide campaigns to national coalitions, we wouldn't have seen that ripple effect, that butterfly effect of change. Um, in another way that you can think about this, um, like connectedness between local city, um, state and national levels is if you also think about members of Congress. So we have a few Muslim or a couple Muslim, um, members of Congress right now that, you know, were very engaged with their committee and with their constituents before they even reached Congress, right? Before they even made it to uh, to their like congressional offices, they were very engaged on a local level as city representatives. Um, and then they moved up to being, you know, state representatives. And then from there, they um, are now members of Congress. And so, if you think about their local districts and their constituents, I think building with those members of Congress is much, much easier because they have a long standing relationship with their people and a long standing relationship with their constituents. So, whether we're talking about um, a specific policy or a specific issue that you're building, or if even if we're talking about a specific target, um, and I, I say target meaning, you know, key players or leaders in our community or an elected official. Um, it's also important to move on all levels of governance um, and think about how we can build in that direction. So again, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, please feel free to type in your questions and we will um, dig deeper. Alrighty, and now Nadia will tell us how that looks like in terms of organizing and advocacy. Great, so one of the one of my favorite ways of advocating is through community town halls and at the very basic level, this is when um, you get together with members of your community, kind of all of the people in the roots of the tree that Johanna explained. And you, the one of the ways you can build up the tree is by inviting your um, Congress member or Senator or other constituent, other policymaker, other politician, um, to come have a town hall in your community. And I think why I love town halls particularly and why I think we can really, it's a really good opportunity to take advantage of because unlike 
a phone call or an office visit uh, in a town hall, the legislator is making the effort, like clearing their schedule to come to you. And so it really highlights um, that you you can really use this opportunity to tell your story, make your ask and show the collective um, the collective advocacy and the collective power that your community has. Um, so like town halls, just kind of going briefly to, towards them, there are some best practices in how when you attend a town hall, how you can um, how you can communicate. And so um, there's like, uh, of course, there's a lot of work that goes into planning town hall, scheduling them, getting everyone together, doing media, all of those pieces. But then once you get there um, and all that work has been done, it's important to kind of follow the same steps that we've been we've been talking about. So you'll see a, a clear, clear kind of pattern here. So when you stand up, you um, introduce yourselves. Once again, if you're a constituent, very important to highlight that. If you have some sort of special background that makes what you're about to say like even more credible, if like your profession, your lived experience, um, that's helpful to identify as well. Mm -hmm. um, second, you thank them for coming. Um, it helps it helps build goodwill. Just remembering again that they've traveled, potentially made time in, in what's a very busy schedule to come to this event. So just showing appreciation for that. Um, you can tell a brief story about how this issue that you want to speak on has affected you and your community, um, why you care about it, and then again, make a very clear ask, a specific ask that makes it harder for the member to sidestep the issue that you raise. So you say, um, you know, let's say you're worried about pollution in your community. You can say, you know, my name is Nadia. I live in this community. I'm one of your constituents. Um, you know, I really like to run outside and it's very hard recently because there's so much pollution. Are you supporting this bill that's going to reduce carbon emissions or something? Um, and so it, it gives a very specific ask that the person can then say, yes, I'm supporting it. No, I'm not supporting it because I think this bill isn't strong enough. And what I am working on in this issue is X, Y, Z. Um, and it just really gives you like a good, um, a good, um, a good way to communicate. And then once again, as we've emphasized, and I saw comments also sh um, sharing the importance of follow up um, af after you um, um, after you speak to the, to your member. Um, any opportunity you would um, follow up, raise any issues that you weren't able to raise during the event, or just uh, follow up again and explain to them that um, why this issue is so important to you and reiterate the ask that you have of them. Right. Um, so just wanted to flag that we have, I think, about 13 more minutes. So um, one thing I just, one one note before we move on, um, think about town halls, anything that your congressional um, uh, member or elected official states at those public events is a public statement. So it's also, again, think about the strategy behind it. If you are asking a question, um, frame it in a way that is um, more of a yes, no question that they can't go around and uh, record it as a statement. So that's also good if you are building a campaign or trying to get like a very definitive answer from that public official. And that's something called bird dogging. But I just wanted to put it out there before we move on to the next slide. Um, Nadia, do you want me to quickly go over digital organizing for the sake of uh, time? Sure, and then sure, we'll, sure. Okay. we'll just go through the rest of the slides very quickly, um, just because you wanna leave time right. for questions. Um, and I believe the, the slides will be made available afterwards, or you can email us and we'll send them to you. So um, right. if you if you want to learn more. So or one last aspect of how you can amplify your message and your narrative narrative obviously is digital organizing. So if you are a Gen Z person or a millennial or literally anyone, you probably have a phone and we spend a lot of time on social media. And um, that's what a lot of organizers and activists and politicians and literally everyone, corporations, 
um, do to get our attention, right? Every strategy, uh, every campaign, every movement will have a digital organizing aspect to it. So even as an advocate, even as an individual, think about how you can amplify that message through um, your digital platforms. If you are an organization, um, you're probably familiar with the letter writing campaigns, or even if you're an individual, you've probably seen the call to, uh, call, different calls to action that um, specific uh, groups, uh, like policy and advocacy groups, share all the time. So what those those are very helpful because what that looks like is just a pre-written, pre-drafted letter that you can just add your name to. Um, and send literally within minutes. So if you have access to those platforms like Action Network or any other uh, platform that allows you to uh, develop a letter writing campaign that is accessible, digestible, and very easy to spread, um, be sure to do that. Um, and again, everything about letter or the main purpose of letter campaigns is that you want to blast the office with those emails. It's all about numbers. Um, so people power, numbers, consistency, and doing it within a specific time frame. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight is um, obviously social media storms. So they work similarly. Again, um, all focus is on um, spreading awareness, um, sharing with as many people as possible, tagging your targets, right? So. Uh, making sure that whatever content or demands you're sharing are be, are reached or, or reach the the politicians or elected officials or whatever entity that you are trying to reach. Um, but at the same time, it also serves the purpose of spreading awareness on a specific issue with your community members. And so what a lot of groups will do is create those sample content and um, posts for folks to just easily share and spread. And again, it's usually within a specific period of time. So social media is very, very important as well. Um, another thing that I think um, people don't take advantage of um, very often is uh, utilizing op-eds in the media. So, you know, speaking to reporters, um, maybe pitching an op-ed that you can write or publish, um, and, you know, just being more vocal about our lived experiences, especially if you're an impacted person, is very, very important. So here I'm using um, one of our former legislative fellows actually that shared her experience as a, um, as a Muslim American in post 9-11 America um, this past September because it marked 20 years since 9-11. And so highlighting those lived experiences and the impact of um, post 9-11 uh, policies on the Muslim American community is very important. And a lot of it was done through social media, op-eds, interviews, um and digital organizing in general and then the last i think this is the last slide is um if i feel like everything that we mentioned could really be expanded on um, <laughs> so i wanted to leave you with just like a golden rule for what strategic advocacy look, looks like um, and again, something that's memorable and short. So when you think about smart or strategic advocacy, um, it has to be one, strategic, meaning does the action fit into a larger plan that will move you uh, closer to your, to your goal and gains media attention, committee attention, and put um, the, the key players on a hot seat. It also has to be measurable, which means can you evaluate the success of your actions? It has to be accountable. Do you have the backing of your base, your organization, your committee members, again, your allies, but highlighting and emphasizing impacted community members at the grassroots level. So make sure that everything you do is accountable to those people. And then realistic and time specific. So is this action realistic and achievable? Do you have the resources and the person power and time that you need to meet your objective? And is it time specific? Do you have a specific timeline to achieve those actions or goals? And what do you need to get there? So if, you know, if there's one way to kind of like quickly rem remember these is just think of like smart actions, smart campaigns and smart advocacy. Um, and we, yes, we will share the slides. Um, I've seen <laughs> some comments about that. So we will make sure that we share those slides with all of you. 
And I want to open it up for questions now. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so yes, feel free to add any comments or questions. We will be reading them. Um, Okay, so Abby says new mode uh, provides digital advocacy tools, call, tweet, email letters to the editor. They have exhibition booth here at Netroots. Awesome. Yes, uh, definitely check them out. There are a lot of very, very helpful uh, platforms these days. So it should be very easy to uh, build a, like a digital organizing campaign. Um, all right, so if we don't have any questions, I'm just going to share some parting words with you um, before we close. And, you know, just remember that regardless of your background or where you come from or your level of expertise, you always have an advantage. Um, not being a policy expert is actually an advantage because you bring those lived experiences, right, as an impacted person or someone who's connected to an impacted person. Always feel free to reach out for help. Um, Polygon or any other organization or group or organizer, civic engagement organizations are always there to um, help. And then show that you have numbers going back to the importance of community power and people power. Abby is asking, what is the best way to schedule a meeting with your rep? Do you suggest setting up a meeting as an individual or a group? Um, it's better as a group. They will give you time um, they're more likely to allocate time for you if they know that you are bringing um, more than just yourself, unfortunately. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, always coordinate with uh, different, you know, if you have a constituent or two that you can bring, those are very important people to be at those meetings. And then if you know of a community leader that can join you or um, anyone of, you know, who's who might be influential, uh, is also very, very important. If you know of any community organizations that are connected to that elected official, also reach out to them and say, hey, I want to schedule a call or a meeting with, um, with that representatives. Um, how can we make that happen? So usually they prefer group um, meetings just because it's more strategic and um, it makes more sense for them and you as well. Tips on speaking to elected officials who are likely against your policy ask. Great question. Um, you want to meet them where they are, right? So you can't go to someone who's completely against your policy ask and ask them to change the world, right? So you want to know, um, are they movable? Uh, and how can you move them? So you'll start with little asks, maybe more moderate asks. Um, maybe even reaching out to someone who has some type of influence on them. So I'll give an example of a difficult situation that we've had in California um, where the person we were meeting or the elected official we're meeting was not really down for our cause, but we found a way to include someone who organizes fundraisers for that member of Congress and is very influential and, um, you know, has a strong relationship with that member and she was the one that led the meeting she was the one that um kind of uh you know took the lead on talking points and made sure that if that member of congress continues to oppose our cause then he will definitely lose those supporters who have been there for him for years now so um Whenever there's um, a target that is not moving on the issue that you're thinking about, think about how you can move them. Think about power mapping. And I wish I had more time to talk about power analysis and power mapping, but this would be my tip for you. Um, I would give one more tip, yeah. and that's um, just reiterating something that um, we mentioned before about storytelling and stories from impacted mm -hmm. young people. Or, sorry, I work in the juvenile justice system, so I always say young people, but stories from impacted people, because even if they, the best way, I think even like if you look at like sociological and psychological studies, it's like getting empathy is the best way to move the needle. So if if we can even start to build that empathy, like maybe they completely disagree on the policy ask, but they can look at us as like community members and neighbors and people and 
can empathize right. with that, that is really the first step. And it's through stories that that can happen. Right. Bobby, I'm going to try to answer a question <laughs> in the last few seconds. Um, you mentioned Senator Cinema. So if, again, everything that we mentioned so far, try those. But if it's a very difficult person to reach, there's always, they're always interested in something. They always have um, interests or strong relationships with coalition members, or let's say some members are more open to interfaith coalitions than secular coalitions. Um, so try to make it a friendlier approach if you feel like they might be not willing to meet with certain organizers that might be more intimidating to them. Uh, just kind of, you know, find uh, some type of common ground where you can secure that meeting to share your points. So again, um, a lot of times that looks like just reaching out to people out of your comfort zone, maybe or out of your networks to ensure that they can join you for that call or you know someone that's connected to that elected official i hope that helps but um yeah <laughs> all righty i guess we are done